Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's about two-thirds of the way through the book. And um, I think we'll be coming across a passage we'll all be familiar with. Uh, it was this passage I preached from when I was 18 at a youth rally um, and, uh, in, in my hometown. Um, and it went a little long. So I will do my best not to, not to do that here. Uh, every preacher struggles with uh, his eternal clock when he, when he gets started. Uh, the first five verses is, is Paul warning Timothy the day will come in the latter times when people will fall away from the faith. They will follow out their own lust. And I can't imagine that ever being reality, can you? Uh, he says before he turns on the TV. Uh, but then we, we go down to verse 6. And he, he is again charging Timothy uh, to, to be faithful minister of the gospel regardless of the context, regardless of cultural pressure, uh, and regardless of even response. Um, and your ministry in the church is vital and, and don't give up. It's a very important passage. So he says, starts in verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, and these things go all the way back to chapter 1, uh, his emphasis on the gospel and on godliness, uh, you put these things for the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Now, at the end of the day, that is the goal of the minister, and I would say of the believer, that we would stand before God and be, uh, and be commended for faithfulness. The American dream and the Americanization of evangelicalism puts numbers ahead of faithfulness. So if we have enough buds and budgets, then then we've we've we're, we must be really good. God must be really proud of us. But actually, faithfulness is what matters. So you can be a Jonah and preach a single message, and an entire city be reformed. And I pray that happens. But you can also be a Jeremiah, where you faithfully proclaim for decades and, and hardly anyone responds. Now, Jonah does so kicking and screaming. He ends up doing what God asks him to do, but it comes by means of, of unrighteousness. Strive to be more like Jeremiah and be faithful to the calling God has for your life and leave the results to God. Now, that's, I think, something that uh, experienced ministers learn uh, over time. Uh, particularly in an American context where numbers and building size and all that is what matters. No, what matters most is faithfulness. So you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. For while body training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. So you see that there is a temptation in uh, ministry life for distraction. And I can uh, affirm for you that is very much the case. Uh, we've talked about this more recently in our study of 1 Timothy, so I don't want to belabor it. But uh, there is a tendency for many of us to, to chew on the minor things of Scripture rather than on the major things of Scripture. And as a result, we're malnourished. It's, it's like eating candy instead of uh, beans and cornbread, right? Um, you, you, you can have candy, but it's, it's, it's not good for you. And you can spend all your time on um, common questions of the Bible and uh, intricacies and everything else. Those things are fascinating. Uh, but we would do well to meditate upon Christ and His gospel as revealed in Scripture. Um, and, and Paul says, look, if, if you are training yourself for some athletic event, so I do a lot of running, if I spend all my time working out the right bicep, well, there's some benefits to upper body strength and running, but, but you should be focusing on running, right, and, and endurance. So, too, uh, when it comes to godliness, don't be distracted by the unnecessary things. Rather, train yourself because the benefits aren't just eternal benefits. They're also benefits for life here and now. Uh, that we have responsibility to those that, that we love. For to this end, we toil and we strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Again, is a is a simple statement of the gospel. Our hope is in a living God who saves those who believe. Right? I mean, that, that is just 
basic Christianity, isn't it? But it is so good. Uh, and this leads, verse 11, command and teach these things. Now, now the question of verse 11 is, is, is he looking back to what he said in the previous 10 verses or looking forward to what he says in the final few verses? I think the answer is yes. That you look back and you say, look, command godliness and, and lead with godliness. Keep them from being distracted by these, these, these little things. But also command and teach these things that, that, that follow. And what, what we see here, verse 12, favorite verse of every teenager, right? Let no one despise your youth. And I agree with that 100%. But, but when we think of despise, uh, there's two ways that we can look at that, how we apply it today. One is, is to think little of young people, right? Oh, you're a teenager. You can't possibly understand what is going on here. The other way we do it is we set low expectations for students. And it is that latter one I'm afraid that too many students are acceptable of. So if you respect but still hold low expectations, well, they're just teenagers. You can't expect them to act with responsibility. Old enough to know better but still too young to care, that sort of mentality. And what happens is it goes beyond adolescence and, and teenage years. It goes into the young 20s. So what we see now for the first time since the Great Depression, more young people, and when I say young people, I'm talking about hitting 30, are, are living with their parents than they are out on, on their own. That, that number has, has, has always been, as you can imagine, uh, you, you, you get in your 20s, get married, kids, all that sort of stuff. Now it is we are delaying adolescence to where the average man is getting married about to age 27, 28, something like that. And, and we, for some reason, don't see the, the problems with that. And it's a particularly a problem within the church. And what you have there is a despising of young people. What we we're doing is we're setting the bar too low. Think about your youth ministry right now. Is your youth ministry as deep as a five-minute devotion? Hey, guys, let's all get together. Let's entertain each other. And then we'll throw Jesus' sprinkle dust on top of it. And then we'll expect long-term discipleship. And then we wonder why for 50 years we've been losing students. We're retaining maybe 5% of students that come through our youth ministries and our churches. Why? It's because what we're doing is we are despising our young people. But what we're also doing is that young people are okay with that type of uh, despising and disrespect. And that's got to change. It must change. Look, if your student can understand calculus and chemistry, they can understand the cross. Right? And young people... If you can study those things, then a deeper relationship with Christ is more than possible. It should be expected. So our youth ministries need to change. Our churches need to change. One of the worst things we've ever done is we've created a sub-church within the church. We call it youth ministry. Rather than seeing youth ministry as, as, as a part of the church's broader ministry, what we've done is we've given their own buildings, their own rooms, their own services, their own way of doing everything. And then we wonder when, when it's time to get out of uh, a teenager church, they come to the real church, they, 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 they can't, can't, can't comprehend. Um, that's not helpful. Let no one despise your youth. Hold yourself to a higher expectation and accountability. Um, and may we do the same you so let no one despise your youth but and so so this is that but that is so important again what we usually do with this text is we say hey just because i'm a teenager doesn't mean that 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 i can't have responsibility right just because i'm a teenager just because i'm a young person right but part of that has to be earned doesn't it it's one of the things that whenever i was a student minister i had to bark on all the time the the battle between students and parents is simply over freedom Students believe they should have all freedom. I just go do whatever it is I want. Parents would say, well, no, this, this is a process, okay? And, and so this, this is where the clash is. And so I always encourage students, demonstrate uh, that your responsibility, that, that, that you have earned the right to this. And as a general rule, I, I think, I think you, you will receive it. It's not something you get right now. So uh, don't let others despise your youth, but set an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Right? So that's kind of an important part, right? Demonstrate godliness, and you'll be trusted with, with leadership towards godliness. Until I come, devote yourselves to public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. And notice, that is the job of the minister. To devote oneself to public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. 
This is the ministry of the Word of God. That is the primary function of the pastor. Again, if, if, if seeing grandma's ingrown toenail uh, is, is a good part of pastoral ministry, and I believe in it, but it's not the primary work of ministry. Now, in that comes, yes, a ministry of Scripture and prayer, and that's why it is important. But what we oftentimes do is we assume the preacher has no job other than what he does for 20 uh, hopefully only 20 minutes on his Sunday morning. If he's got all week to, to do whatever, we've got to give him stuff to do. And that's not true at all. Most of faithful ministers are overwhelmed with what they have, let alone uh, on biblical expectations that is thrown on, on top of them. Um, one of my mentors uh, warned me uh, about this tendency in ministry that a lot of people think that because you don't have much to do, they assume uh, they can just call you at all hours of the night and have you do these, these weird things. And, and the example he gave was uh, this, this lady had a, a, a raccoon or skunk or something under their house, called the preacher to get it out. Now, if you're in rural ministry, that's pretty common, uh, stuff like that, those, those, those sort of requests. Um, and, and I've had some uh, similar to that, not exactly that, uh, everywhere I've been. And, and it's a struggle to say, no, this is family time. That's something that can wait till the morning. Or this isn't a priority of our church right now. Stuff like that. Uh, but Paul says here that if, if you're a minister of the gospel, your primary responsibility is the teaching, exhortation, and preaching of God's word. That is the priority. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. This is where we get the idea of laying on hands at an ordination. Practice these things. Don't just preach them, but also practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. It's fascinating, isn't it? That here, while you're leading in godliness, you demonstrate a growth in godliness. That's, again, something that I don't think we think about much when it comes to ministers and deacons. Um, whenever I was a kid, I thought that whenever you hit adult age, whatever that was, 18, 30, whatever it was, I thought you had, like, it all figured out. Because when you're a kid, you go to mom and dad, and they always had the answer. Right? So if you have a temperature, they knew what to do. If you had a cough, they knew what to do. If you, if, if you didn't like that bully on the bus, they knew what to do. Right? They, they, you, just, you hit this age, and you just arrive. What I've learned since, and what makes parenting so difficult, is parents are themselves still growing growing into greater maturity. And um, the same is true with your pastor. We may assume that once you get ordained, that you've got it all figured out. That's not true at all. Look, I'm, I'm not the same man I was whenever I was 19 and became a youth minister, or 24 and first became a pastor. I'm not that same person. I look back thinking, man, I would have handled some of that stuff a little differently. Would have articulated things differently. And I hope people have forgotten this and that. Because we've, we've grown. And that's true for all of us. And so here Paul wants to show that um, you demonstrate godliness, but you also grow in godliness. So you can say, in the context of a local church, people who are growing with you, may not be what I should be, ought to be, could be, but I'm not the person you first met all those years ago. And that's because of the grace of God and the fellowship of believers. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Notice that, that godliness is not just a corporate responsibility. you got the, the progress language. It's also a personal responsibility. Stay vigilant on your own doctrine. And, and one of my problems with a lot of American evangelicals is that we lack that, don't we? We lack a clear theology. What we believe in is God is good, Jesus Savior, Bible's true, I want to go to heaven. And often our theology isn't much deeper than that. Look, if, if, if we want to recover some of what's going on in our culture, our faith has got to get deeper than, than what it is right now. It really must. We've got to make our faith a priority. And too often, it has not been that. Persist in this. For by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So this work of ministry...
has eternal value. Eternal value. Before I went live, I had on my computer a YouTube documentary about a famous sermon preached by John Piper. I think I think it was 25 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever it was. Uh, it'll be on my website in the next few days. Um, the famous Don't Waste Your Life sermon he preached at Passion in, I believe it was in Tennessee. And his main point of that, light of that sermon was, you can have the American dream. You can have the fancy car and the nice house, the picket fence, the dog and two and a half kids. And then you can make it to retirement and you can spend your life uh, collecting shells. And, and that would be the last thing you do when you meet your maker. And then what would you have to present to God? Nothing but the American dream, which has no eternal value whatsoever. But what if you decided not to waste your life? You have one life to live. And everything about you will be gone and forgotten except the investment you make in the kingdom of God right here and right now. Will you not waste your life and instead dedicate your life to godliness and dedicate your life to the work of the kingdom without neglecting the gift that God has given you? If you want things to change, let us start with you. Hope to see you guys here tomorrow.